Welcome back to my educational series on the microbiome with information you'll find nowhere else. This video should outrage the carnivore fanatics and I know I'm going to get a lot of heated comments. However, all of my videos are highly referenced to include this one. It's not like I'm just making this stuff up and I have no experience in the matter. With over 20 years in the industry, and as the former head of medical education for Microbiome Firm, and now with my own platform, I understand the science and data points like no one else, and I use that to help legions of people. If you want to bury your head in the sand, knock yourself out. But for the vast majority who are open to logic and critical thought, keep on watching you may find the information of use. I will start by saying that there are some people who get relief from the carnivore diet. I'm not going to dismiss that. There are also some people who get relief from probiotics and or fermented food, the low FODMAPS diet, the keto diet, antibiotics, and other measures. But if you get a benefit, and many don't, it is most likely that it is only temporary and even more so sets you up for a worse condition down the road. I already have videos with hundreds of references which address antibiotics, the low FODMAPS diet, the ketogenic diet, and probiotics and fermented foods. And my keto video makes many of the same points as this video does, but in here I've included all new original research references beyond what's in the keto video to help drive home the point. So if you're not convinced after watching this, check it out. Let's first look at some of the epidemiological evidence. The diet and microbiomes of the centenarians, people who live to 100, are not those of pure carnivores. In fact, far from it. These people don't eat much animal protein, and in fact, they really don't eat that much at all. And their microbiomes are not reflective of a carnivore diet. The set of signals required for longevity, such as the sirtuin pathway, are quite different than the set of signals that the carnivore diet provides, such as high mTOR. And if we want to stay on the aging theme, one concern is osteoporosis. This paper comes from 1974, back when the original Eskimo diet was still intact. They had what is essentially a carnivore diet, eating caribou, sea mammals, fish, and birds as their staple foods. Now you may say that their osteoporosis could be due to a vitamin D deficiency but that was ruled out. The authors concluded that, quote, the acidic effect of a meat diet, presumably as related to oxidation of sulfur rather than handling of organic phosphates, appears to be more likely the factor. It has been long known that acidosis increases calcium excretion and causes bone dissolution. And it has been supposed that bone serves as a homeostatic buffer. In humans, a high-protein diet, even with controlled intakes of calcium and phosphorus, greatly increases urinary calcium and causes negative balance. This is something I talked about in my video on pH, which has mountains of data to support it. But honestly, living to 100 and osteoporosis are not on the minds of most people on the carnivore diet. They have two main reasons. One is for weight loss, and it does work but you need to support the microbiome for either the keto or carnivore diet, and it should not be a long-term thing. See my keto video. The second is due to a condition or illness, usually centered around gut health. These people tend to be highly reactive to plant components, such as salicylates or oxalates, with high histamine, GERD, SIBO, diarrhea, constipation, skin reactions, you name it. And I will admit, that there are a number of compounds within plants that can be problematic. You have to ask yourself, why are you immunoreactive to these compounds while most of us are not? Instead of radically limiting your diet by following the carnivore or low FODMAPs approach, you need to address the root cause, the source of the dysfunctional immune system. See my videos on autoimmune disease. And this starts in the gut where dysbiosis drives inflammation, gut permeability, and systemic immune responses. So let's see what the carnivore diet does from a few papers. In this study with 19 healthy obese subjects, the high protein diets significantly reduced the abundance of Roseburia and Erectale, 
If you're familiar with my videos, you know I'm always raving about these two superstars of the microbiome. And why were they reduced? Because their fuels were removed from the diet, and the environment, think pH, shifted out of their favor. In this study, the high-protein, low-carb diet is highlighted in Table 2 and resulted in marked decreases in rosburia and erectile and significant increases in toxic compounds produced by protein fermentation, shown in Table 5, which led the authors to conclude, quote, after four-week weight loss diets that were high in protein but reduced in total carbohydrates and fiber resulted in a significant decrease in fecal cancer-protective metabolites and increased concentration of hazardous metabolites. Long-term adherence to such diets may increase risk of colonic disease. And here's another study. This time they labeled it the paleo diet. Keep in mind, in none of these examples were they truly zero-carb carnivore. These diets still had some prebiotics coming in, in the form of locked-up sugars. The diet labeled here as strict paleo had a dramatic increase in TMAO, a topic for a later video, but suffice it to say, a bad thing. The paleo diets also had significant reductions in bifidobacterium and rosburia. Many other studies also show significant reductions in bifidobacterium, carpococcus, R. bromii, and lachnospira. All taxa I constantly rave about. This is further driving dysbiosis in your gut. So perhaps in the short term you feel fine on your new carnivore diet, but in time the bad actors will further drive an inflammatory environment both within and outside of your gut. Just a brief pause here in the presentation. If you could just hit like and subscribe, it would really help this channel out. So what's going on here? Invariably, some amount of protein will make it past your small intestine and enter the colon, the amount of which depends on several factors. Probably the most important would be the excessive quantity as in the carnivore diet. With the exception of a few species, the good guys do not ferment protein, but the bad guys do like it. And in the process of this fermentation, harmful compounds can be produced. Just one is hydrogen sulfide. And this proven harmful compound, along with the branch chain fatty acids, cresols, and others, are products of protein fermentation without adequate controls in place, i.e. carb fermentation, resulting in what these authors say is, quote, an altered microbiome favoring a potentially pathogenic and pro-inflammatory microbiota. From a different set of authors, they say the same consistent thing. Feel free to read this text, or the paper, or any of these papers. To continue on the theme of protein fermentation, we can look at figure one, where we see what are called the aromatic amino acids. Tyrosine can be fermented by the microbiome to the toxic compound P. cresol, which I discuss in my video on cardiovascular disease. Tryptophan and phenylalanine can be fermented to other problem-causing compounds as well. I will launch a video on tryptophan next year. Other amino acids like cysteine and methionine can be fermented to sulfur compounds like you just saw with hydrogen sulfide. And by the way, it's the sulfur in these two which is a huge player in the calcium loss we saw earlier from the Eskimo study. And there are other amino acids, like the branched-chain amino acids, which we will now take a look at. The branched-chain amino acids are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. There are many studies linking an abundance of them to diabetes, which of course is a risk factor in many diseases. In this study here, branched-chain amino acids were significantly positively correlated with insulin resistance and negatively correlated with insulin sensitivity a bad finding. Just like with the LPS shown here as well, the inflammatory agent from gram-negative bacteria. But branched-chain amino acids are critical for growth and make up about 40% of the amino acids required by mammals. But bacteria, particularly bad bacteria, crave them as well. So are there ill effects on health due to signaling once absorbed or to pathogen feeding further on down the GI tract? Here's an important consideration. Studies using branched-chain amino acids in supplement form have shown metabolic benefits. But wait, 
a ton of studies show that that should be a bad thing for metabolic syndrome. Well, amino acid supplements are single amino acids which are easily absorbed, whereas whole proteins need to be broken down to amino acids for absorption. Therefore, if the GI tract is compromised and or there is too much protein intake, like carnivore, then excess protein and peptides make their way down to the lower GI for fermentation, feeding bad actors, and producing inflammatory compounds. There are other considerations in addition to the ones we just highlighted. For example, a high protein fermentation environment has one major implication. It makes the luminal pH more basic, in other words, less acidic. This is hugely important as now the bad bacteria can outcompete the good in this environment. Watch my video on pH to learn more about this very important topic. In addition, pathogenic bacteria thrive in an amino acid rich environment, particularly the branch chain amino acids. Studies have shown that the proliferation and virulence of several bacteria are restricted with lower branch chain amino acid levels. Even the poster child for opportunistic pathogens, E. coli, is reduced by low concentrations of protein in the diet. In addition, None of this takes into consideration the excess pro-inflammatory saturated fat which accompanies this diet. And fatty acids are important on many levels to include the fact that long-chain fatty acids from, say, red meat have been shown to drive a more hyperinflammatory Th17 immune response, while the short-chain fatty acids, think butyrate, drive a more tolerant T regulatory immunological state think autoimmune disease and food reactivity. A protein-rich environment drives inflammation and immune dysregulation, which then causes reactivity to food proteins that the rest of us don't react to. But here's the great news. When you put properly dosed and blended prebiotics into this mix, these problems are resolved simply by feeding the true health promoters. This paper illustrates nicely the major bacteria involved in butyrate production which is key to health. This data from 2,387 samples from three continents highlights only the most abundant butyrate producers which were detected in at least 70% of the subjects. Most of these prominent butyrate producers do so via fermenting carbohydrates. Of the four butyrate pathways, only one is via carbs, but it is the most prominent. Three are via amino acids, i.e. protein fermentation, but they are in the minority. And in a further breakdown of the carb pathway, you see many of the names I'm always raving about in my videos. F. prausitzii, Carpococcus, E. rectale, Roseburia, E. halii, Anarostypes, and Eubacteria. And even within the amino acid butyrate producers, we see health promoters like Odoribacter, Ocilibacter, and Allostypes. It is these bacteria you want to promote. And other than Allostypes, because Odoribacter and Ocilibacter also possess acetyl-CoA pathways, you feed these health promoters with prebiotics, which have sugars locked behind bonds that we cannot access but they can under the right circumstances. The goal of this video is not to inspire you to go vegan. Far from it. I personally eat two eggs with breakfast, and my lunches and dinners always feature lamb, steak, chicken, pork, or fish if it's fresh. The idea is that if you are healthy, you need to balance your diet. If you're trying to lose weight, you need to support your microbiome while on a high-protein, high-fat diet for a limited amount of time. And if you are following the carnivore diet for a given condition, then you have to understand that you are immunologically reactive for a reason, and that reason is dysbiosis. And although the diet may or may not help in the short term, in the long term, you're creating an environment suited for the bad actors, inflammation, and more immune dysregulation. And in time, you may find that you'll react to more and more foods. Maybe it's time to try something more intelligent, something that addresses the root cause. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. And I will say that uh, basically every single day on my YouTube comments and in emails, I get a lot of thanks from people out there who really appreciate the information I've been sharing. 
And so part of that is you're welcome. The other part is you can contribute by uh, doing clicking on the super thanks below. And if you're not uh, doing a consultation with me and you're not purchasing any protocols, it's a great way to support this channel. Uh, each presentation, depending on you know the presentation, uh, but most of them take an incredible amount of time to put together. There's a lot of material. There's a lot of data checking. And so it's just, it's just you know, sometimes 50, 60, 70 hours to put together one presentation. And so if you can just click that super thanks, I'd appreciate that. And we'll keep the information coming.